Hey, good afternoon. Um, give it just one more minute. Uh, still got some folks piling in here. Just give a little extra extra minute. Get those folks in.
It looks like traffic has slowed down. Um, Rick, if you could do me a solid and uh, get folks in, go ahead and get started. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, TJ Boyer, and uh, welcome to uh, uh, November 21st, uh, 2024 uh, JE call. And again, uh, uh, if there's any new folks that join the call, um, the call purpose is just sharing information between uh, the JEs and the RDNA group. Um, just, you know, want to promote some coordination and so do some information exchange uh, to and from the users there. But uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to kill my camera here. So bandwidth don't jump on me. But um, everyone should have received uh, a couple of attachments in the um, email today, uh, one being the uh, the FAQ for uh, current with this, uh, with that FAMOF access information, and uh, sharing again the uh, next gen with this uh, FAQ uh, document, as well as this agenda. So you all should have those in your boxes. And without further ado, uh, we could kick things off, <clears throat> open up to the group. Uh, any kind of uh, emergent issues um, that anyone wants to share with everyone. Okay, uh, if if not, um, as we progress, uh, feel free to um, bring anything up. Uh, that you you may have, um, especially for the uh, round robin <clears throat> later on in the meeting. Okay, a couple of reminders and some awareness. Um, again, I mentioned the uh, the the uh, FAQ from uh, current with this, and that's the uh, we're, we're we're planning on a, in early December um, transition to. Uh, a just a slight change in the FAMOF uh, authentication and to get into with this, um, which means that every user will <laughs> will need a FAMOF account to get into with this. Uh, the document that I shared uh, it contains information and some kind of direction and uh, flow chart towards the end to assist with the transition. And um, we have that document posted. Uh, in multiple spots. Well, one general spot, but we have it um, in multiple areas. So uh, we start off here on the, with this uh, home page. Um, we replaced the old FAQ uh, for FAMOF that we had originally uh, with the updated version with this new uh, new change here. So um, we have it here on the with this home page, and it'll get you to this to to the document. And again, it just um, you know start off with some of those frequent asked questions with this uh, new change that's that's happening when getting into with this, and just just some instructions on what that will look like and how can you move about getting into to uh, with this, and to uh, really bring it home um, a little flow chart uh, to help guide users, you know if. They are sure, or they just need to uh, really uh, get a get a good flow going into getting into uh, with this there. So that's one spot. Um, the next spot uh, uh, with it's over on the RDNA site where we actually host the document. So under the GA editor resource page, uh, we replaced that uh, FAMOF migration document with the new. Uh, FAQ document there. And so finally, um, we have it located, let's see, here. Um, I know folks are, are familiar with, with this page here to get into with this. Um, we updated the uh, 
the message here to to include the uh, the new uh, FAQ document and submission to the new uh, what well, the new release uh, date for this change. Uh, yesterday, many users, uh, including you all, did receive an email from the application um, that was sent out of this change as well, and I think it included uh, the uh, link to that document as well. So um, it's been it's been advertised in uh, many different ways. So um, hopefully, it'll uh, help um, users get into the application. And but again, if you know any questions or any uh, issues, uh, you're welcome to uh, give us a call uh, or uh, go through uh, IA help desk uh, with any issues there. Let's see, okay. Um, yep, again, I did share the, uh, the GA editor resource page, so uh, the current and past uh, quarterly notes and uh, recordings are, are found there. And they're also found on the uh, RDNA YouTube page. And I shared this link here with this next bullet. Um, NextGen has posted some new demonstration videos for the Spatial Fire Planet services. And um, these four are the current videos that's been, been shared on that YouTube link. And so, um, yeah, if you go to the uh, that YouTube link, it'll take you to the RDNA page, and you can find the videos within here. You're also, if uh, I guess quick access under the playlist, you can find those under the with this tutorial uh, section here. You're ready to find those um, videos. So more to come. <laughs> More to come. So those are the most current ones of recent that was recorded. Let's see. I get us back. Okay. Um, also a reminder, um, the next year is with this UAT help site. Um, here's the link here uh, for those folks. Um, need some uh, further assistance with next gen with this and again any upcoming trainings or hey, things uh, dj yes sir just a real quick note on that for that help link for for next gen with this uh, we we do have a much friendlier url that the help content is getting moved over to their uh, hosting team is just in the process of uh, finishing up uh, getting that all set up so expect that link to change fairly soon to something uh, much easier to to memorize yes so. Just a heads up. Thanks, Rick. Okay, and uh, any upcoming training dates or things we need to worry about, uh, let us know. Um, we get those things added to the uh, JE calendar and training calendar there. So uh, uh, I guess I could pause here. Uh, any questions or any uh, concerns? Uh, no shared documents. <laughs> links okay all right uh moving on um no updates since our last meeting uh so if there are any je changes please let us know uh we could get their roles adjusted and um, add those folks to the mailing list as well as the uh the IA help desk contact list there. Uh, for staffing for RDNA, uh, not much uh, change um, other than uh, Erin Noonan. Uh, we mentioned on the last call that uh, she was coming on board uh, as acting deputy program manager for 120 day uh, detail. Um, she has started and we're glad and thankful for her to come in and step into that role and Looking forward to continue uh, working with her. Uh, Greg Dillon, um, detail is, is is coming around the, the corner here. Um, he's going to continue as active program manager here with our DNA uh, through early December. Um, we're working to uh, backfill that vice uh, program manager detail that uh, he's currently sitting in. 
And so uh, more to come on that, on who will be stepping in uh, next in that detail role. All right, um, so for classic updates, uh, we're on track um, for our next uh, release, which is 8.3.2. And, and again, you know, that's scheduled for early December, which will include that new uh, change, that slight change on how users will log into with this. And just the, the big takeaways uh, out of that, um, you will need that fam off account <laughs> anyways uh, to access Nixon with this that's coming up in 2025. So, um, so that's the, the positive note there. And then, um, Again, for that 60 day uh, security requirement, uh, not have to necessarily worry about um, getting in, into with this itself just to meet that requirement. Uh, it looks like you could get into uh, any of those uh, applications that um, that go through that INAP, which was uh, which is formerly known now as FAMOF, uh, such as like FIMS or you know IROC, SIT 209, uh, EGP. So. That will uh, meet that requirement uh, if you jump into one of those applications there. So it reset that timer. And then uh, for the DOI users, it should help with their ongoing issue uh, with the PIV card uh, access and with this. Yep, yep, Rick, go ahead. Just a, a real quick thing. It was in the, the email or in the uh, the document that, that we have posted, but uh, for this group, for WUFDIS Classic, you're still going to handle role requests from people the same way. It's still, you'll get those requests in the application. Uh, you approve them inside the WIFTIS application. Uh, you, you won't have to touch really INAP for, uh, for this change for classic WIFTIS. So just wanted to, to emphasize that. Yes, absolutely, man. Uh, yep, and like Rick mentioned, uh, we have that uh, in the steps here that you know, explains <laughs> what we just mentioned there. So, um, yeah, please, please take a look at it. If you, you know, got any questions, it, um, cause you're going to see where it mentions roles for with this, but, you know, we explain, we, uh, the, if the, with this application still maintain that, um, control over that. So it's just a formality to get you guys just into with this through there. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, other than uh, this uh, release that's coming up, um, we also, um, other than FAMOF, uh, we did add a few other minor issues uh, that are getting wrapped into this release. Uh, mostly just little stuff that was done previously that was not major enough to warrant a release so we're just going to push it out with this one. Um, we also added in this release some archival work that will help with the uh, sunset of classic and transition with next gen. And those activities include getting some uh, archival databases uh, created and ready for uh, storage of, of, of that data there. So uh, things are moving along uh, with those preparations. And uh, again, we're just continuing some of those uh, sunset and transition activities for the application, just you know, just figuring out what data uh, we're going to archive and how we're, we're going to archive it for that standpoint there. Uh, so that's in a report for Classic. Uh, um, any questions? I could pause there. Okay, uh, so uh, for our statuses, uh, we have the uh, integration testing that's coming up um, in January, end of January, and um, I think that's going to be at the Esri headquarters this year. And so uh, a lot of our team members, um, particularly with uh, NextGen, will be a part of that to uh, test and get things ready uh, for that version 10 uh, integration there. So uh, I think they're they're looking like they're still on schedule for March 5th of 2025 for Erwin version 10 release. 
Uh, so things are moving along. And next we can move on to uh, to the dated team. Um, uh, Jonah, did, did you want to uh, speak with for uh, data? Yeah, sure thing. So good afternoon, uh, Jonah Vaughn with the RDNA team. Uh, we put this out a couple times, but just to confirm with everyone, can still make edits in Wiftus Classic for FMU SO language and MR shapes and language. Um, we will be pulling the final poll on January 6th of all that data to go into the Spatial Fire Planning Service, which I will be oh, demoing next. OK, perfect. Um, and then after January 6th, you will still be able to make edits in Classic, but those will not automatically be pulled into the Spatial Planning Service or NextGen. All right, so we launched our beta application to test Spatial Fire Planning Service earlier this week. So I will go through that. I'm going to turn my camera off as well to share this. And, and while you uh, um, get spooled up, Jonah, um, Wes did send out uh, the link and um, the uh, some of that guidance on the, the new uh, the beta for that spatial uh, fire planning services. Uh, in the agenda, I did add from the excerpt from his email the link to the uh, beta service and um, some of those instructions that he laid out in his email. Awesome, thanks, TJ. So yeah, we're yeah. using a. This is all going to be run through the NIFC ArcGIS Online organization. I know a lot of you guys have seen this demo from other groups, but bear with me here. So this, we start with a hub, just so we get the shortened URL, the isfps slash nifc.hub.arcgis.com. It's kind of a landing page that right now will take you to the training application and eventually we'll do both training and production. So then clicking here, loads you to the actual experience builder. Just reminding you that this is beta testing only, and you promise to be a good data steward. We have a link to the guide that we're still working on and flushing out here, as well as an option for you guys to submit feedback, things you like, things you don't like, uh, errors you find in there, and then just an enter page. And then I just put those dates on there again about what data can be edited, where and when, as we move into next gen next spring. Okay, so when you load up the application, you default to this view data tab, and this is all filtered over here on this query. So I was working with the Park Service yesterday, so I'll show an example for them. Um, you can filter all the way through GAC, agency, et cetera, or you can just throw in your unit ID and cut straight to the chase. You do have to hit apply to run these filters. So they have two shapes showing. Clicking on this will zoom you in, highlight that, and bring up all the language associated with that shape that we pulled out of uh, Wiftus Classic. Toggling this gives you all the data about the polygon that we've uh, exported as well. So this is park wide. All the language related to Parkwire there. Um, every one of these pages has this little blue question mark where Wes Hall did a very nice job of making videos for you guys. So those videos TJ mentioned, you can find on YouTube. Clicking this here brings it up. You view it right on the page. It's a quick demonstration for uh, each page there. After you have viewed your data, you see an error in the language, you want to edit it. Move on to the next tab here. Same thing, you work through your filters or just throw a new unit ID to get them all. Work on that general language there. This brings up your edit language. You can activate it, deactivate it. 
change the language itself, approve it, approval date, tracks all that fun stuff there. And then we're adding in categories. So in WIFTA's next gen, you decide on your strategic assessments and your course of action within the application based on your planning area. And if you want, you do not have to, you can predefine your COAs and essays for all your shapes right in here. So which one was the one I was looking at earlier? Ah, uh, yes, another park service one. All right, let's do that in right. Hmm, I didn't break this a minute ago. Did I? All right, there we go. It's loading. Okay. So for this one, FMU is one is the WUI. So in the WUI, you might want to set your course of action to full expression. Uh, your strategic assessment might be a protection objective. You can update that. And not currently, but we're working on getting this data to pull directly into NextGen as you're working through your decision. In, as it pulls in as a default, you can still change it uh, in each decision. Right, moving on, shape approval. So we're not doing shape editing within Experience Builder just because there's a lot of limitations on what you can and can't do in here. So that'll be done in ArcGIS Pro. This one's a little different where you need to actually click on a shape to approve it. So we built these sweet shapes out here at the Fire Lab. Click on that, loads it up. Activate that shape, approve it. And now it'll show back up in your edit language to Patch language to it. Eventually, not eventually, we have data coming out of WIFTAS Classic. It's either language without a shape, it's a shape without a language. We're calling that the misfit data. So that'll all get dumped in here so you can go and find stuff. If you're going through your, go through and view your data and you can't find what you wanted, it'll end up in here to be like, oh, yeah, we lost that language somewhere, or it was deactivated, et cetera. Then you'll have to copy and paste that back into the main service. Just a couple of guides here. Talk about we're building out that uh, shape editing guide and how that workflow will work in Arc Pro with that online feature service. That's about all I got. Any questions? Uh, one thing I should note in this current testing service. We have noticed that we're missing a fair number of management requirements that did not export out of this classic uh, correctly. So we know that they're missing. And I don't know if Susan's on to mention, talk about that real quick. Yeah, we had an error on the export. Well, we thought it was on, on our end, on the model end, but it's actually not. Um, we have a little bit of corruption in classic in the Oracle database. The developers have been able to fix over a thousand features that were missing. So we're down to a handful of 17 features that aren't coming over in management requirements. So when we release version 85, which is soon, um, if you're still seeing missing management requir requirements, please submit a help desk ticket. And it's probably one of those that uh, just got completely corrupted. Um, and our apologies for that. It was kind of an insidious error that we did not catch. Um, we thought you guys were just cleaning up your data nicely. So um, we saw the count drop, but it dropped by a thousand and that, that got us really suspicious. Um, other than that, most units are coming over cleanly. Um, the other error that you might see in the test data right now is I did not make the field big enough for some of the language. Um, we have some language that's over 8,000 characters in that field. We're working with the developers to make sure we define a limit on that and we'll let you know which ones get truncated. Um, that's just an unfortunate limitation that we're facing and, you know, I guess the advice is don't pop, don't 
copy your entire land and resource management plan into one set of language, um, that's going to blow up on you. Uh, but that's the two major errors we're seeing, some missing management requirements and some truncated language, and we're working on fixing that. Great, thanks. All right, moving on to the groups. I think CJ included these in the email with the notes, but to access that spatial fire um, planning application, they have three groups on NIFC org here. Um, you have the data manager, where you can add edit language, update those categories, shape labels, etc. But you can't do anything with shapes. Then you have the these are out of order here. Um, then you have shape editors, which can add and edit language, create new shapes, add existing shapes. They cannot approve those shapes. Finally, you have the shape approvers. They can do pretty much everything. Um, all three of these groups are visible if you're not a member. So you can go and find them and request uh, membership, and then we will add you in as needed. That's all I had. Any questions? Oh, a couple of hands. Um, Wendy. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for giving us um, that update and overview. Um, so for BLM Alaska, we're looking at making some pretty significant updates to our um, district FMPs um, based on a number of resource management plan updates. And um, that will probably entail some uh, spatial data updates as well. And I was just curious um, for those folks who need to um, load new um, data layers or update um, the existing ones that have been brought over, what is your advice on um, when when should we expect to be able to do that safely? Um, do you have an idea of a good date uh, for us to be able to um, get into the spatial data planning and um, make those updates? Yeah, yeah so, I'm, oh, go ahead, Jonah. Oh, basically just going to show it here. You know, like, um, as of now, you can make shape and language updates to management requirements. And then in FMU and SOs, you can make language edits all the way up until January 6th. At that point, we will be, that'll be our final pull of data out of WIFT as classic to incorporate into uh, this production version of the application editor. And we're giving ourselves friendly date of February to get that set up for you guys to actually make your edits that will go into next gen. Uh, hopefully it'll be sooner, but that's just to give us enough time to finalize everything on that one. Yeah, and I'd add that, you know, the shape edits will take place in ArcGIS Pro as a check-in, check-out process. We're working on that guide, uh, but it's very, very similar to what you do with pods. Um, so if you've been working on pods or you have a staff that's been working on pods, they should be familiar with the check-in, check-out and work on the geospatial side of the data. Again, we split the language out to make it a little bit easier for people who are non-geospatial centric to edit their language and make those fixes online in the application Jonah just showed. Um, Barry's question in the chat. Um, yes, per unit, you know, if you have multiple SOs and MRs, they should come in. The um, um, the one new shape that we don't have yet in there, and Alaska, pay attention, I'm pushing some of your data in the test data for that, is the multiple, multiple unit shape. So if I'm understanding your question correctly, Barry, which I might not be, if you have shapes that cross unit boundaries, those will go in the new multi-unit shape bucket. Right. No, it wasn't anything that crossed boundaries. It was just some language in current WIFTIS um, that applies to the entire unit. And those are both SOs and MRs. And uh, and just wondering 
how that will work if they if all of that language will all be compiled into one entry when you select that unit boundary shape or or how that will work gotcha no it'll be multiple entries it's going to come across as multiple like that so there'll be some cleanup where people might have some duplicate language uh, what was that example we were looking at this morning um jonah oh there was yeah that one's a little different where they had multiple language across different FMUs, same language, different shapes, but so you'll have one unit boundary shape that will include all the language at that right. uh, unit level. Okay, I see in that one, those are multiple language languages yep. attached to that one boundary. Okay. Yep. And yep. And maybe what I was looking at the other day was just an instance of them not all coming through or MR is not coming through or something. Um, yes, I'll actually, wait to, I'll wait to see the production update. Yeah, and we did have an issue I fixed this morning where multiple languages were not showing. We had this as a text field where only the first related table would show. I fixed that this morning to a list, which is why you're getting all of your entries um, per shape now. So if you go back, oh, okay. you should see that updated now. And maybe and, I have not looked at it today. That was a day or two ago that I was looking when it, when it first came out. So first came I'll out. look yeah, again. Sure. Thanks. Sweet. Thanks. Yeah, but don't uh, don't panic if you're missing um, management requirements. We did we did trace that down yesterday, and just we knew we were missing a few. We just didn't catch the scope of the the technical problem on the Oracle side. So it was a little bit bigger than we thought. And I'm working to get those in. Chip, you had a question. I do, yeah. Going back to the um, that predefined course of action field, um, and I, I don't necessarily need to see how you put it in there, but I'm wondering, like, what's the intent of that field? How does what you enter in there end up showing up in a decision? And what are the implications of predefined course of action versus an actual incident course of action that's developed? Um. I don't think we were planning to show it in the app today, but basically in the application, when you're running through the strategic assessment or the course of action stepper, um, you'll be able to choose a spatial fire planning shape. And if you've predefined that course of action, then that is what you will be presented with. But if you want to change that course of action, you will be allowed to. You have to write a justification of why you changed it, and that will go into the decision. There is no link, though, between the spatial fire planning data in the application for editing it. So if you change that course of action on the fly because conditions warrant it, that's not going to change in your in your parent data, your service for spatial fire planning. That will still remain whatever you set it as default for the next fire in that area. So we're allowing you to override it but we're also allowing you to set the default so you don't have to decide what you want it to be while you're working through the steppers. Does that answer your question? I hope it does. No, sort of, yeah. Is it a required field? Not at this time. It is not required no. in the spatial fire planning. And, and I don't anticipate we will make it uh, required. We just wanted to make it easier when you went into those steppers. Um, it was originally a request from the Park Service so that they could re predefine some of this so that they didn't have to worry about, you know, that thought process when they were going through it, unless there's, like I said, a compelling reason to override it. Thanks. Uh, Eamon? Yeah, just follow up on that. Uh, I mean, it seems redundant with the strategic objective, I guess, for those of us who are like common with this decision editors. Um, is this a way, so like if, uh, say you got a, a fire in, a, in an area, you can manage fire for resource benefits but you don't want to do that right now. It, it then allows you, like it's in that SO already, but it allows you to take a different course of action, essentially. Yep. I think that hits it. Yeah, I, that's all I got for now. Okay. But no, not a required field. You don't have to do it. Uh, again, it was requested by uh, a couple of different agencies. They wanted to be able to predefine those course of actions and strategic assessments. Uh, but in the application, you can use what you've predefined. You cannot predefine it, or you can override it within the application if you want to. 
answer Kevin's question here in the chat for the majority of GE, GAEs about which group. Uh, it kind of depends on your GIS savviness. Um, the most obvious one would be the data manager, where you're going to be editing language. Um, but even that goes back on planners more than anything else. But then if you have the, I know some of you guys are doing both anyways, but then if you have, if you're comfortable in ArcGIS Pro, um, then you'd be fine in that shape group as well to be editing those and building those shapes. One thing I forgot to mention is that we'll also be launching the updated version of the jurisdictional agency layer in January before our production level spatial fire planning uh, editing application goes live so that you'll have your brand new unit boundary shapes in the JA layer to just copy and paste if you want to put some uh, unit wide objectives in there. Uh, TJ, I don't know if you had anything else on the other, anything else on the agenda to cover after me, or there's any more questions? No, that was uh, that was about it. Um, uh, the demo for uh, Spatial Fire Planning Services. Um, any any questions? Further questions? And we, and we have been giving multiple uh, more in-depth demos, and we have some recordings on that as well. So uh, look, keep looking for those demos, and we'll let you guys know when we get uh, some of these fixes through. Uh, we're working hard to get that in, um, I'm hoping, by Thanksgiving or shortly after Thanksgiving, version 85 will get pushed out. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Jonah. Fun stuff. OK, um, so we're getting to the uh, round robin um, portion. So um, yeah, uh, just share any coordination opportunities that you have, uh, any upcoming fire activity, and some trainings or, or any uh, feedback uh, for with this. And we could start things off with Alaska. I'll be quiet. This is Casey. I'll go. Um, only real news for Alaska. I can think of is is we're working on on uh, getting trainings for next gen. That's on our on our radar, and it's good to see everything moving along. But nothing really to add for the group. And it's good to see you guys are using the fire manager options as a as a test for the multi unit shapes. Anyone else from Alaska have anything I'm missing? Nope. Well, good. Uh, well, thanks to Sam and Wes and um, Sue who showed up for the uh, for a little demo of Next Gen last week. It was helpful. Appreciate that. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's go with uh, Eastern area. Hey, good afternoon, TJ and everybody. Uh, eastern area fire activity in the western part of the GAC is subsided. Uh, eastern part of the GAC uh, still pretty active. Uh, we've got d decision support up supporting multiple states from Maine all the way down to Jersey. Um, yeah, we are still working on scheduling some next gen training for early winter uh, to early springtime. Don't have those dates yet. We'll get those out. Uh, that's all I have for a report. Is there anybody else in the eastern area that has anything to report out on? Okay. Thanks, Joe. All right, let's go go with Great Basin. Nothing for BLM Idaho. It's pretty quiet. Yeah, good afternoon from the forest service perspective no no real fire activity just some prescribed fire um, we started uh some trainings with our fire planner group and have some stuff scheduled with west december 19th and then we'll be looking to schedule some additional stuff for our agency administrators into the spring and a report nothing for fish and wildlife service 
regarding Great Basin. All right, good deal. Okay, uh, let's go uh, with North Ops and, and South Ops. Uh, good afternoon for North Ops. Uh, no anticipated fire behavior. Um, we have not scheduled any with this next gen trainings, kind of hoping to let it mature just a little bit more before we go down that route uh, based on what we've been seeing and hearing um, from what's available out there right now. Uh, but it's definitely on our radar. And uh, no other region wide with this trainings planned. No needs or concerns. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else for North Ops or South Ops? All right, Northern Rockies. This is Carly with BLM. Um, really nothing to report other than uh, cleaning up um, with just reports and ensuring that fires are being called out, but very little activity. Thanks. I don't know if Jonathan Olson is on. Um, this is Aaron Noonan. I am uh, a GA editor for the Forest Service. Um, Northern Rockies, we are uh, still doing some prescribed fires just around the GAC. Um, as far as training, um, I know the Forest Service has something planned, and I can get the dates uh, on the Flathead, uh, the Flathead National Forest. I want to say early spring, um, but for the most part, I think uh, much like uh, North Ops, we're sort of um, we're we're pretty immersed in fire hire and other activities, and we're waiting for the development of next gen to kind of get uh more flushed out and hoping to kind of invest some time on this come january to really start tackling the the training and that's end of report for us thanks no issues no concerns for fish and wildlife service in northern rockies all right thank you Okay, uh, let's go with Northwest. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, as far as Oregon, Washington, BLM, things are pretty quiet. <clears throat> Did have our our postseason BLM meeting last week, and for feedback uh, in a AAR of the, the CIMT process, and uh, you know the pre mobilization calls uh, that happened with that. Uh, just for some feedback, trying to stress the connection between that pre-mobilization call and the and the PMS 236 Part D that uh, is done in WFDIS and trying to help agency administrators in, in making that connection that that uh, is a tool that should be uh, utilized in those. So that's it for, for us. Not much to add for Forest Service for Region 6 or 10, um, but really our entire focus is on next gen at this point, and uh, things are pretty darn quiet on the wildfire front. Thanks. Things are quiet for Fish and Wildlife Service for the Northwest. We're looking at doing some next gen training potentially at our FMO meeting in the spring. Other than that, ops normal for us. Thanks. All right. Uh, swing to Rocky Mountain. This is Amy for the Forest Service. Uh, we are still pretty dry in portions of our region, but we're not experiencing very much fire activity at this point. We're beginning to implement some RX burning and starting pile burning. We'll be scheduling some with this next gen trainings after the first of the year, but haven't jumped in too much yet. And a report. This is Glennon with BLM Colorado. Um, the only thing I have to add from what Amy said is that I wanna thank RDNA for doing presentations at our postseason meeting in December or for being willing to appreciate that for spatial fire planning service as well as next gen. I think it'll be great. Thanks. Okay. Nothing else from the state. 
Oh, thanks, Rocco. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go with Southwest. Yeah, this is Rance with BLM Arizona. Um, very light IA in the southwest part of the state. Not planning on any WUFDIS trainings at this point, as uh, North Ops and South Ops alluded, waiting to get fleshed out a little bit. I am playing with it to have, get folks ready. And other than that, folks are on AL and things are pretty quiet other than on the hiring front. So that's all we got going here in BLM Arizona. Uh, this is Val with BIA Southwest. Um, just trying to get a lot of our line officers uh, up to speed with uh, next gen rolling out. We do have some changeover in line officers. so. It'll be fairly interesting. A lot of them are fairly new to the fire side and they're kind of going back from classic, but just reusing them back. For the spring uh, FMO meeting, but other than that, that's what we got for BIA Southwest. All right, uh, Southern area. Hey everybody, Dave Quisenberry for uh, Forest Service. Um, not much to report. Activity really light. Uh, don't see that changing in the next week or so. Uh, I've got the next gen training on the 10th, December 10th. I'm hoping to get um, tons of people through it um, that day and uh, maybe, you know, thinking about scheduling maybe one or two more in uh, late winter. And I'll work with y'all to schedule those and report. Okay. Well, thanks, Quiz Bear. All right. Uh, is there uh, any other uh, thoughts or any uh, news came to mind? Okay. If not, um, our next call is scheduled for December 19th. So um, if there's nothing further. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, if I don't get to hear from you or talk to you, I hope everyone enjoy the uh, Thanksgiving holiday that's coming up. And uh, I will catch you on the next call. Thanks, TJ. Bye.